Hello and welcome to another episode of the Defining the Dash podcast, where we are here to make it count. Today I'm your host, Mark Mullins, and we are going to pick up for a few minutes where we left off last week when we were dealing with the doctrine of prayer. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass that, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. What an inquiry that was from one of Christ's disciples to Christ about prayer, how to pray. Last week we talked about the importance of prayer and what prayer was. And as you will remember, Webster had to find prayer. And he said that prayer was a solemn address to the Supreme Being. It consisted of adoration or as an expression of our sense to God's glorious perfections. It could also be a confession of our sins, supplication for mercy and forgiveness, intercession for blessings on others, and thanksgiving or an expression of gratitude to God for his mercies and benefits. According to that definition of prayer, I look at that and think about that, and I realize that prayer is a big deal. Prayer is also a privilege, like we talked about last week, and it's also a necessity of prayer. And so not to recap what we talked about last week, but to uh, go a little deeper into the topic of prayer and the doctrine of prayer, uh, first of all, this morning, I want to talk to us about unanswered prayers. I'm going to talk a little bit about unanswered prayers, and then I'm going to talk about some keys or the rules of prayer, according to the Bible and biblical doctrine. Now, about unanswered prayers first, I want to point out before we get started uh, or go any further into this lesson or into this episode of the podcast that delayed answers are not necessarily denials. Again, delayed answer to prayer is not necessarily a denial in prayer. The Bible tells us that David prayed for a temple, but the temple had to wait on Solomon to be built. Mary and Martha prayed for their brother Lazarus, but their answer came four days later. And so just because you're praying for something or are about to pray for something and you don't get your answer or I don't get my answer in the time frame that I think I should get that answer, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that God will not answer. Uh, sometimes it's, it, the answer may be delayed. Sometimes prayers aren't answered for various reasons. And so... One of the reasons I want to point out to us this morning that may be a reason why prayer is not answered, or a reason why my prayer is not answered, or maybe perhaps a reason why your prayer is not answered. Prayer is not answered when it comes from an unclean heart. According to Psalms chapter 66, verse 18, the Bible says this, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Another reason why sometimes we deal with unanswered prayers is when we are praying to try to avoid some kind of necessary chastisement. Now, I think about this necessary chastisement, and I was raised by a mom and dad that was very well versed in chastisement. Uh, Some of you listeners may know exactly what I'm talking about by your own parents. Um, Sometimes I would make poor decisions, uh, bad decisions. I don't know why I would decide some of the things that I decided to do. Looking back on it now, I have to ask myself, Mark, what was you thinking? I don't have the answer to that. Uh, Obviously, I was not thinking, but... 
Um, but sometimes when I made a poor decision, I would have to say that the law of nature is right when it says that every action produces an equal but opposite reaction. And so sometimes my action would be a very poorly judged action and the reaction would be chastisement, if you will, from my parents. Now, I said that to say this, that sometimes when I was getting chastised, that's probably a good biblical way of saying whipping, but when I was getting chastised, I would pray then harder than I had prayed all day. And many days I hadn't prayed any that day, so it wouldn't take a lot to pray harder than not praying at all. But I would pray and... You know, sometimes I would pray to God that, you know, the chastisement would be a little easier. And sometimes I would pray to my parents that they would stop because it hurt. (laughs) And so, but I would pray to try to avoid necessary chastisement. And the biblical basis of this, as far as reasons why, uh, prayers may not be answered. Is Second Corinthians chapter twelve verse seven? Paul writes and says, "Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me, and He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness." Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Another reason why prayers, my prayers may not be answered or maybe even your prayers may not be answered is when it is offered in arrogance and pride. When it is offered in arrogance and pride. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Prayers are not answered when they are offered in arrogance and in pride. For example, if I was to go before God's throne room in his mercy seat, and I would ask him for a petition or a prayer request, if you will, And I would present it because I am asking you, God, to do this because I am hosting the podcast episode on prayer. And that's the only reason, my only accolade, or that's the accolade that I present to God, and I'm prideful and I'm arrogant about that, then that prayer may not go very far. According to the Bible, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. According to that verse, if I want to get on God's bad side, then I would say a prayer and I would present it uh, the way that I just talked about. So I choose to try to stay on God's good side, and so I'm not going to approach prayer that way this morning. Another reason why prayer may not be answered is if prayer is offered by selfish motives. If I have a petition to God and I really would like to see a miracle, but that petition to God is all wrapped up in my selfish motives, then that petition may not be answered. Matthew chapter number six, verse five says, and when this is what Christ said, Jesus said, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. So when I'm praying, according to Jesus, if there's, if I want to get a prayer answered or have God to hear my prayer, Jesus, God's son said not to be as the hypocrites are. Well, how are the hypocrites? And so, And Jesus here defines how these hypocrites are. He says, For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying standing in the synagogue. There's nothing wrong with praying at church, standing up. There's nothing wrong with praying on the street corner. 
But this other part is the part that got the hypocrite. And that was that they may be seen of men. The reason why they prayed in church was not to get closer to God. It was that their brothers and sisters would see them praying. The reason why they were praying in the corners of the street was not to pray for the sick or for the homeless or for the discouraged or those that were oppressed. Jesus said that they prayed that way, the hypocrites prayed that way, that they would be seen of men. And then he said, Verily I say unto you, they had their reward. Now, I don't know what that reward is, this life or the other life or in both lives, but I know whatever that reward is, I want nothing to do with that. Another reason why prayers sometimes aren't answered is if we are praying to God for something, we have to have faith. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Sometimes our prayers don't get answered because we do not have faith. We have words. We have a concern. We Sometimes we run out of every other option in life. And so we try God as the last door to try to open to get something done. And we do it with meaningless and repetitious phrases that doesn't mean anything because it lacks faith. The Bible tells us in Hebrews eleven six again that without faith it is impossible to please him. Interesting here that the Bible talks about some keys here to faith, and I'm about to get into the rules of prayer and some keys of prayer. But here the writer tells us that he that cometh to God must believe that he is. If I'm trying to pray to God about something and I just simply don't believe that God exists, That lack of faith in God's existence shoots me in the foot at the very beginning. I have to believe that God is, that he is alive, that he was alive, that he will be alive, that he hears us when we pray. I have to believe in God. But I also have to believe not only in God, but also have to believe that he is a rewarder, that God is a rewarder. God has a way of giving things, rewarding things, blue ribbons, if you will, in life, that God is a rewarder. Not only does he exist, but he also has to believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So I have to be diligent in prayer, and I have to believe that God is and that God is a faithful rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Finally, a reason why prayers sometimes are not answered, my prayer or your prayer, is when it is accompanied by a conscious sin. When prayer is accompanied by conscious sin. First John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say, that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Can I give you a word of advice on this morning on this podcast? If you're struggling with sin and you, you know about that sin in your life, your best shot at giving a petition to God and asking him to answer your prayer is to first deal with the sin that is separating you from God. Whatever that thing is, it might have been cheating on your taxes. It might have been texting an ex-girlfriend. It might have been little white lie at school. 
It might have been cheating at school. It might have been breaking the law, driving down the road. But if there's a conscience sin in your life, you first have to deal with a conscience sin. Now, for the second half of this podcast, thank you for listening and uh, continuing to hear uh, this podcast. I'm hoping I can help somebody. In the second half of this podcast, I want to talk about the roles of prayer or reasons uh, or keys to prayer, if you will. So we talked a little bit about what prayer was. We got a definition of prayer. We know reasons why God does not answer prayer. But I don't want to leave you there because then, you know, you'll be all depressed and I'll even tune back in again. And so we got to do something. We got we got to get some positive stuff going on here. I don't have Chad with me, and so I've got to do this on myself. If Chad was here, it makes he brings the positivity. And so I'm going to do my best, Chad. Number one, uh, kind of accenting what we talked about, about faith. One of the keys of prayer is that prayer must be accompanied by faith. We already talked about that a little bit. But I want to give you a word of what Jesus said. Jesus said himself in Matthew 21, 21, talking about faith. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. And then he says, these are the words of Christ, Matthew 21 and 22. <laughs> And all things, and all things, whatsoever, ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Prayer has to be accompanied by faith. Words aren't enough. Proper sentence structure is not enough. Three to four sentences in a paragraph or two to God is not enough. I have to believe. You have to believe. Our prayer must be accompanied by faith, according to Christ. Something else uh, about prayer is when we go to prayer, pray, we must pray in Christ's name. Now, that's kind of interesting, and that's interesting because when we pray, a lot of times we'll gather around the dinner dinner table, we'll hold hands, that's how we do it in our house, we'll hold hands, and my oldest daughter, she's about nine years old, she was this morning anyway, uh, yesterday anyway, Um, she's about nine years old, and she is the first one, as soon as hands touch her eyes are closed, and she is saying a prayer. And the reason why she does that is she is ready to eat. We've got to get this prayer thing out of the way so we can eat. And so let's get the prayer done so we can eat. (laughs) But it's interesting that we've taught her in her praying. At the end of it, we always say, in Jesus' name, amen. What does that mean, in Jesus' name? That's the way I was taught. That might have been the way you was taught. Uh, A lot of people are taught that way. Why do we pray in Jesus' name? Well, the reason why we do that is because that's what mom said to do, right? Right. But also the reason why we do that is because when we are praying in Christ's name, we are praying in the name of of the one name that is above every other name. When we're submitting a request to God in prayer, we are given Christ's name because we are submitting it based on the character and the merit of Christ. So let me give you let me give you a real world example of that. And so the character and the merit of Christ. Now, if I were to give you a check, and on that check, I would write you a $100 check, cash, 
for whatever reason. Maybe just to give it to you. Now, don't y'all be texting me asking me for 100 bucks. Okay? This is just an example. Just an example. And so, you can take that check to the bank. And if that check is signed, then you can take it to your bank. And if I have the money in my bank... To cover that check, you take that check to your bank and you deposit that. That money should come out of my account and into your account because it is signed. And the money is there to cover it. That check in some ways is based off my merit and my character. Now, the other side of that is if I were to write you a million dollar check, which I do not have a million dollars. But if I did write you a million dollar check and I signed it as a fraudulent signature and I gave that to you, that shows that I'm a man without character and a man without merit, regardless of my signature on that check. And so those of you that know me, you may not even waste your gas taking your vehicle to the bank to deposit that check because you knew on the front side that it was a fraudulent check. And so I said that to say this, that when you sign a check, that signature is based off somebody's character and merit. And so when you're cashing a check, that's what we're looking at. And so that check is in the name of so-and-so. We're praying to God and we say in Jesus' name, we are presenting the character and the merit of Christ, God's only begotten son to God. And essentially what we're saying is, God, you know your son's character. You know his merit. You know I'm saved. You know that I'm washed in the blood. You know that I am a uh, joint heir with Christ. And in the name of Jesus, this is why I'm praying this prayer. That's probably clear as mud. Um, I'll try to revisit that down the road when I can clarify a little better, maybe. But John tells us in John chapter number to kind of uh, the doctrinal point behind that, John chapter 16, verse 23 says, Jesus says, And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Our prayers have to be offered in Christ's name. Now, something else, another rule of prayer or key to prayer, is that oftentimes prayers are offered Simply and secretly. Simply and secretly. Matthew tells us in chapter 6, verse number 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Our prayers must be offered simply and secretly. Kind of goes along with what Jesus said about the hypocrite. And when he said, don't be like the hypocrites because the things they wanted to do, they, they would stand in the synagogues and the corners of the streets and that they might be seen of men. But when Jesus is talking to his followers, His recommendation is to pray in your closet with the door shut to God the Father and he'll see you in secret and he'll reward you openly. Another key to prayer or another rule of prayer is that prayer must be persistent. Persistent prayer. A lot of times we go through life, if you're anything like I am, and you have a mental checklist and you feel good about things. Once you check that box, you feel like you can move on to the next thing. And sometimes you can, you know, um, but prayer is not that way. Prayer sometimes has to be persistent. Jesus says in Luke chapter 11, verse nine, he says, and I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. 
if you're praying about something and God don't ask you the first time and you've asked God for something and you're doing it simply and secretly and you're doing it in the name of Jesus and you're doing it by faith and as far as you know, you don't have any conscious sin and as far as you know that your prayer is not arrogant and it's not prideful and it's not selfish and you're not coming from an unclean heart and you're just got a petition before God, ask and it'll be given you. But then the Bible says, the seeking you shall find. If you've asked and you ain't got an answer, there's nothing wrong with taking the next step and seeking for it. Start looking around for it. Start Put more effort into it, if you will. And finally, if you don't have an answer then, then the recommendation, according to Christ, was not to just give up. Then he recommended maybe knocking, knocking, and it would be open to you. A couple more points and we'll be done. Uh, another key to prayer is that prayer must be offered in humility. Must be offered in humility. You have to be humble. Now, there has been a discussion between my wife and I as to whether or not it is humble or humble. And I think I usually say humble, and she says humble because it has an H. And I try to convince her that it has a silent H. So that's still up for debate. But either way it goes, prayer must be offered in humility. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 9, and he spake this parable to certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others, and said that two men went up in the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He prayed with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Now, what's wrong if we stop here a few verse or a few words before this verse ends, and the Pharisee stands and prays and says, "God, I thank you." What's wrong with being thankful to God? There's nothing wrong with being thankful for God. We ought to be thankful to God. And then he says, "I'm thankful that I'm not an extortioner. I didn't do anybody wrong. I'm thankful that I'm not unjust. I've been just to everybody. I've tried to live my right, life right." He thanks God that he's not an adulterer. What's wrong with not being an adulterer? What's wrong with not cheating on your spouse? There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's actually biblical living. But then he says that he thanks God that he's not even as this publican. I'm not like this other guy going to church with me. I'm different. And I thank you, God, that I'm different than this other guy that sits on the same pew as me and sings the same songs I do and goes to the same Sunday school class that I do, but he's just different. And then he gives his accolades and he says, I fast twice in the week. Two times a week, I fast. I give tithes of all that I possess. Checking a box. Checking the fasting box. Checking the tithing box. Checking that he didn't cheat on his wife. Checking that he's not unjust. He's not an extortioner. And then the Bible says, Jesus says, and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. But he but smote upon his breast. He hit himself in the chest, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you see the difference in this? You've got one guy here that is prideful. You've got one guy here that is arrogant. He may be a Pharisee, but he is a, a specialist in the law. He may know all about the things of God. He may have done not been extortioner, unjust, adulterer. He may have fasted this week. He gave tithes this week. He's done all these great things, but he is arrogant and he is prideful. And then you have this other guy, this publican sitting over to the side, this common guy coming out to church today. And he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you see the stark contrast with this guy, how he is a guy that is humble? And he's a guy that's asking God just to show mercy to him because he's a sinner. And he realizes that he's a sinner. And if God don't do anything else for him, God, would you just have mercy on me, a sinner? Honest with God, honest in his prayer, honest with his petition. And here's what Jesus said about these guys. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. 
which guy went to his house justified. It was the publican who came to God in humility. And Jesus says, for everyone that exalteth himself, puts himself on a pedestal, raises himself high, wants everybody to see me when I walk into the church, when I walk into work, when I walk into school, because I am me. Jesus said that everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, be brought low. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Very, very interesting. I could spend a whole day on that, but I'm not going to take that time. My last point here uh, before we close out this episode. A key to prayer, to having answered prayer, the last key is that it must be offered by one who is right with others. We spend a lot of times in our Sunday school classes, maybe our churches or you know, street ministry or whatever it is about being right with God. And that is so important, the most important thing in this world that I can think of, in this world and the world to come. But in a second place order, or maybe somewhere in the order to the top of priority, is being right with others, those around you, when it comes to prayer. I know that may have caused you to scratch your head, that may have even hurt your toes or my toes. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, doctrinally, he says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. When we are praying and we are presenting things to God, petitions to God, and we're seeking him, and you've got your hands up at the altar and you're seeking God or in your prayer room, in your prayer closet, and you remember that there is somebody that I need to apologize to. It may be to my children, it may to my, be to my spouse. It may be to my employer. It may be to my coworkers. It may be to the church members. It may be to my pastor. It may be to the person working at Walmart. It might have been the person at the bank the other day. You need to go and be reconciled. Make it right. And then come back and offer thy gift. I'm out of notes. I hope that was good. Um, I hope it was profitable and worth your time. I appreciate you listening in to us today. Hang in here with us. Chad will be back with us next week. I'm sure you guys miss him as much as I do. Um, and so, Lord willing, he'll be back with us next week. And until then, let's keep making every moment count. And God bless. When I win this war.